On today's World Insight, the September 11 attacks, 20 years on, what have been the effects of U.S. military action in Afghanistan and the Middle East, and has the original goal of making the U.S. safer from terrorism been met? Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The 20th anniversary of September 11th terror attacks in the U.S. is approaching. Following the fall of the World Trade Center, when attackers hijacked the planes to crash into the Twin Towers, terror has been etched in the American life and the rest of the world. In the shadow of the attacks, families and friends of nearly 3,000 dead are not the only ones coming to grips with their loss, but also the Muslim world. They've also long suffered from being stigmatized or discriminated against, especially after September 11th. Today, terror threats still linger from Al-Qaeda, ETIM, ISK, to name a few. The need for global efforts to counter terrorism is long overdue. What's the feeling global terrorism? What more can the international community do to cut down security threats? Let's loop in our panelists. For more on the latest analysis about the September 11th, 20 years on, in Sri Lanka, we have Professor Rohan Gunaratner, the international terrorism expert and head of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research with Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. In Washington, D.C., Brian Becker, executive director of the Answer Coalition. In New York, uh, Saha Aziz, director at Center for Security, Race and Rights with Rutgers University Law School. Last but not least in Beijing, Yan Shuai, Deputy Director of the Institute of International Security Studies with China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. 20 years already, how time flies. At this um, moment, with so many things happening between September 11th, 20 years ago, and now, I really want to have very briefly thoughts from every one of you about how now you see what happened 20 years ago. Ms. Aziz, may I start with you? Well, the last 20 years have demonstrated to many Americans that when fear grips them from a traumatic event, it can cause them to support policies and practices by their government that are against their values. So the racial profiling and religious profiling of Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians that came through national security policies mm -hmm. and immigration policies, and also then legitimized private discrimination by uh, people, particularly on the political right, increasingly so, I see. taught our country a lesson that we need to be very vigilant about defending our civil rights and not allow ourselves to be uh, scared into acting in contravention to those values. Mm. Mr. Gunnar Ratner, uh, what do you think about the past 20 years and the biggest takeaway from 20 years ago? We have gone around a full circle. Today, the Taliban Al-Qaeda alliance, they have returned back to Afghanistan, and the international community will once again need to respond to this pivotal event in Afghanistan by at least building an intelligence coalition from UAE to Japan. Mm. Taliban has not transformed ideologically. It remains an extremist organization. I see. So it is imperative for everyone to work together the same way 
many nations came together after 9-11. Very interesting. I see very different takeaways among the four of you. And, and let me go to uh, Mr. Becker. Well, the 9-11 tragedy was cynically manipulated by the Bush administration, by Donald Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, uh, that whole neoconservative team to launch a foreign policy that had pretty much nothing to do with September 11th under the banner of the war on terror. But it was designed to take out the government in Iraq and Syria and Libya mm -hmm. and to destroy resistance forces in Lebanon. And ultimately, the big prize was to be Iran. So I believe that there was a very cynical manipulation of the rage and grief American people felt after 9-11 uh, to carry out pretextually a new foreign policy. And I think the U.S., by systematically engaging in torture, in Abu Ghraib, at Bagram Air Base, all in the name of fighting terror, legitimizing torture, uh, dropping tens of thousands of bombs on the people of Afghanistan who had nothing to do with okay. the attack on September 11th. Uh, I think the U.S. has exacerbated and led to a growing danger of new terrorist attacks, and the cycle of violence has intensified, not diminished. I see. Mr. Yan Shui from Beijing, what about September 11th, 20 years on, what is your biggest takeaway? Yeah, 20 years of war on terror has changed a lot of things, but I think one thing does not change, that is the threat of terrorism. The terrorism threat is still there, and it seems that even higher compared to that of 20 years ago. We see now in Central Asia, South Asia, in Middle East, in Africa, especially the Sahara region, the terrorism threat is rising, and uh, I'm quite uh, pessimistic that especially after the end of the so-called analyst war of the United States, the ter terrorism threat around the world mm -hmm. may become even bigger and bigger. It is very interesting that from different parts of the world, we have a very different takeaways. The expertise that you have differently, and therefore your thoughts about what really happened and what happened then and after differently. Let me start by going through some of the issues you mentioned one by one. I want to have a personal note about where you were uh, 20 years ago when September 11th took place. And what was your thought at that time, and how do you reflect upon your thoughts at that time? I think even though it's personal, but when we are putting together these thoughts, it really speak for themselves. Miss Aziz. I was a first year law student at the University of Texas, and I went to law school for a very specific purpose, and that was to work on rule of law, democracy, and human rights in the Middle East particularly in Egypt, which is where I was born. And I believed in the American dream. I believed in the American ideals of human rights, that our country took those values seriously. And when September 11th happened, my entire community, my Muslim community, my Arab community in Texas and nationally was under siege. Mm -hmm. Everyone suspected us of at least supporting what happened on 9-11, at worst, knowing about it or even having some form of association with them and supporting Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. And that was the farthest from the truth. And in fact, we all know that the 9-11 attacks were committed by foreigners and who had no connections to the United States or American Muslims. So for me, that period, I lived the ugly underbelly of the backlash and the civil rights violations and Americans behaving in ways that I did not think was possible. Mm. And as a result, I've spent the last 20 years of my career working on rule of law, human rights, and democracy in the United States. Very interesting uh, personal takeaway. What about for you, Mr. Becker? Where were you? I was in Lower Manhattan, very close to the World Trade Center. I had friends and close family members who worked there. Uh, one 
uh, perished there actually because she she worked at a higher floor on the 86th floor. So it was very personal. Uh, of course, Lower Manhattan was chaos. There was bedlam. There was fear. Uh, there was a lot of pollution, of course. Uh, but people not far from the World Trade Center in something called Union Square in Lower Manhattan mm -hmm. started to gather the second day after September 11th. And they started to say, war is not the answer. They actually were singing this song sort of softly. It was a very difficult moment politically and George W. Bush's approval rating soared to 90% and a war fever was created. But out of that small gathering at Union Square, a new anti-war movement was born, which then morphed into the big massive movement against the Iraq war, which came just 18 months later. So. Mm -hmm. It was personal, there was a lot of loss, there was a lot of confusion and grief, but also an awareness by many people in New York that uh, war was not the answer, but in fact, the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration were devoted to doing just that, going to war, and not just in Afghanistan. It's very interesting, both of you in the United States, uh, your reflection upon what happened to your country and actions taken by your country later. But the question to many, really, uh, Ms. Aziz and Mr. Becker, is how would the various administrations from your country be able to do what they did with a series of countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, and the list that goes on, uh, over the past 20 years? What is your thought, Ms. Aziz? The combination of factors, so from my perspective, is first, you have a population that is generally educated through an isolationist lens. And that translates into minimal exposure to international relations and geopolitics and other cultures and other languages. In fact, when you compare the United States to Europe, most Americans only know English, uh, when that's not the case in Europe or, or even in China or in the Middle East or, or many countries around the world. So when then you supplement that with the media coverage, that was completely fear mongering and doomsday apocalyptic. It wasn't reasoned, informed analysis that looked at causes and effects. It was essentially the same methodology that Al Qaeda uses, which is this ideologically based, bombastic, fear driven clash of civilizations narrative, but it was reversed to convince Americans that they needed to give a carte blanche to their government and that they should quote unquote just trust them mm -hmm. and as mr becker said the people in government at that time indeed had an ulterior agenda one that had started at least as far back as 1990 when as many people know who pay attention to what happened in the gulf war one that yeah. cheney and wanted to continue to baghdad and not simply uh, liberate kuwait from the iraqi army and, and also, I agree with Mr. Becker, and this continues today, that there are hawks in the United States government under both Democratic and Republican administrations who want regime change by force in Iran and want to effectively occupy Iran, whether directly or indirectly. So what we see is a population that is easily manipulated and more so when there is a national crisis. I see. And so I, but but, but there is one issue, there's one issue one needs to bear in mind, I mean, about the immediate reaction by the Bush administration uh, for a war in Afghanistan against the uh, quote-unquote terrorism. Uh, is that going to be different categorically uh, compared with other military actions uh, the various administrations took uh, since then, for example, in Iraq, in Libya, and the list goes on. Uh, Mr. Becker. Well, I think that because Osama bin Laden had been given guest status by the Taliban in Afghanistan, the Bush administration and the neocons who dominated the Bush administration's foreign policy realized they had to invade Afghanistan more or less as a box checking exercise in order to go on to their bigger agenda, which was Iraq, which was uh, the resistance forces in Lebanon, Syria, uh, Lebanon, um, uh, Libya, and and ultimately Iran. So you could see the way the war was conducted. The U.S. went in, the Taliban was dispersed, and the Americans basically stopped the pursuit. They didn't chase after Osama bin Laden very fervently. 
Uh, it was basically just, we did that, let's move on. And in Washington, and I was, you know, I came to Washington between Washington and New York frequently, you could see the real fixation of the Bush administration was Iraq. And Iraq had nothing to do with September 11th. Saddam Hussein was not coddling jihadi terrorists. He wasn't working with Al Qaeda. And yet Saddam was, cons was deemed to be such right. a monster in the lie of weapons of mass destruction so that the American people conflated the attack on September 11th with the new target, which was Saddam Hussein, who had nothing to do with it. So again, it became a cynical manipulation of genuine feelings on the American people's part. And right. sadly, the American media functioned as an echo chamber for the Bush administration. Obviously, the, your two voices are somewhat the minority in your country, I'm afraid. Uh, if you look at the decisions being taken uh, for the past the 20 years, uh, voices like yours are not necessarily uh, the majority uh, in the debate. So I want to go to uh, different opinions. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, Professor Gunaratna, uh, tell me more about whether you agree with the earlier two guests, their analysis of the issue. How do you see the immediate reaction of the Bush administration toward Afghanistan and the later series of military actions and regime change attempts by various administrations from the U.S. The Taliban captured Afghanistan in 1996. Bin Laden was offered safe haven. Bin Laden, working with the Taliban, built a sprawling terrorist operational and training infrastructure. It was in Afghanistan that Osama bin Laden with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed planned and prepared the 9-11 attack. Al-Qaeda attacked America's most iconic landmarks, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the fourth plane was going to the Capitol Hill. And of course, the international community joined the United States in responding to disrupting and dismantling the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban infrastructure in Afghanistan because they saw the horror of 9-11. Al-Qaeda was planning other attacks. Al-Qaeda had attacked USS Cole before. Al-Qaeda had attacked the US embassies in East Africa. So it was enough. And there was, uh, uh, particularly the Western response was very strong. But what, where the United States went wrong was that the U.S. decided to invade Iraq based on flawed intelligence. And that diminished the capacity of the United States to sustain their campaign against Taliban, against Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. not only in Afghanistan, but globally, because Al-Qaeda is a global terrorist movement. And today, what has happened is that the Americans lost the will. The American political leaders lacked a vision. And because of that, they could not continue to maintain security and stability in Afghanistan of the uh, Ashraf Ghani and the Karzai administrations. But we must not forget that during this 20 year, year period, there was an Afghan security force that was fighting the Taliban. Okay. But perhaps we should have done more to stabilize Afghanistan, to develop Afghanistan, rather than to militarize Afghanistan. Okay, but uh, Professor Gunaratna, I'm sure you listened to the speech given by the current U.S. President uh, Biden, talking about what exactly has been the nature of mission in Afghanistan for Americans. He talked about we are not here, quote unquote, for rebuilding Afghanistan. We are not here for uh, building regional democracy. We are here to guarantee the security of the United States uh, from being attacked by terrorism and terrorists, end quote. I think that's a very interesting statement right on the eve of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, you know, I understand your logic and your way of looking at the earlier actions, but when you're listening to words like this, what was your immediate response? 
certainly uh, the American government's first concern was whether Al Qaeda will attack the United States again and again after 9/11. That is why they inducted troops. That is why they stabilized Afghanistan, got rid of Taliban, got rid of Al Qaeda. But today, the subsequent leaders didn't have the will to keep to maintain Western forces, maintain mm. U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So it's one of uh, political will. It's one of lack of leadership. It is important for the United States to be protected from terrorist attacks. But looking at what is happening in Afghanistan today, more than 40 terrorist organizations have wish have congratulated uh, Taliban and Afghanistan will once again become a terrorist Disneyland. Okay. Many important terrorist leaders have traveled to Afghanistan since August uh, 15th. Uh, from from many neighboring countries. You are watching World Insights special program, 20 years after September 11th. I'm Tian Wei. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. You're watching. World Insight special program 20 years after September 11th, where our world is. I'm Tian Wei. Let's continue our discussion. Uh, Mr. Yan from Beijing, what is your take of the very first action in Afghanistan by the United States at that time, Bush administration, and the, con uh, and the later the sequence of military actions in other countries today? Uh, Professor Gunaratna already mentioned Afghanistan today. I guess we have to bring in that factor as well. Uh, after the 9-11, and the, the world shows this support to the United States, and we had a strong uh, feelings toward the United States. And uh, when the Bush administration declared, declared the war on terrorism, and the U.S. has had the worldwide support, uh, but. Uh, but uh, after maybe several months, the world or the major countries in the world sees the real purpose of the U.S. war on terrorism. So the course of the war on terror by the U.S. has had changed a lot. Um, it began to use the war on terror to achieve other purposes like uh, regime change or to overthrow the anti-U.S. Uh, government in Middle East and also in Africa. And uh, we know that uh, if with these broader purposes, the U.S. Uh, devoted uh, much more resources to the so-called war on terrorism. And uh, now that we see that uh, its broad purposes has failed, the regime change or the overthrow of the anti-American government has not improved the security of the United States or improved the interests of the United States. Otherwise, it has caused the threat from terrorism become worse and worse. Is that the case about anti-terrorism on the land of America, uh, Mr. Becker? Well, I don't know about on the land of America. I mean, most of the terrorist actions in the United States come from right-wing white supremacist organizations, mm. and that's been true for, for a long time. Um, but on, on the international scale, when you think about it, was there ISIS in Iraq in 2001? No. Was there ISIS in Syria? No. Was there ISIS in Afghanistan? No. Was there ISIS in Africa? No. The ISIS has been the, perhaps the unintended consequence of an adventurous, aggressive, militarized foreign policy, uh, again, not really designed to stop terrorism, but to overthrow governments that the United States considers to be too independent. Okay. Uh, governments that were associated with anti-colonial projects. And as a consequence, as these governments fall, take in Libya, Gaddafi's gone. So ISIS fills the void. Saddam Hussein gone in Iraq. Uh, ISIS filled the void. ISIS and the number of jihadi ISIS fighters has grown exponentially as a consequence of U.S. mistaken foreign policy after 9-11. All right. Professor Gunnar Ratna, do you agree? 
certainly the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq was a terrible mistake. But having invaded uh, Iraq, the U.S. should have remained there and stabilized Iraq. The United States withdrew troops and, of course, that created the space for the emergence of the Islamic State uh, referred to as ISIS. So I believe that governments should be very careful. A key lesson of 9-11 is that if governments want to invade and intervene in other countries, they should have the power to remain. Otherwise, you destabilize those countries, create the environment for the emergence of virulent and vicious actors, okay. and you are unable to deal with a bigger monster. So, you are, Professor, you are saying, if I could uh, translate it in direct terms, once you invade a country, you want to stay the course. Is that what you're trying to say? Absolutely, because okay. you have to stabilize that country and build the All right, then. local forces. Okay, let's, let's go to Ms. Aziz. Do you agree with what Professor Gunaratna, what he just said? In fact, he is not alone in having that opinion. I generally oppose imperialism, particularly by Western countries. I think that the colonial era has just transformed or morphed into something different in terms of how it's implemented. But I don't think that the U.S. Army should be engaging in nation building in other countries unless it is being requested by the government that represents the people and it's requested to assist through development and non-military means. I think what we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq is clear proof that not only does it create more death and violence against the people who live there, but it also feeds into more anti-American sentiment and recruitment for terrorist groups. So I don't think that the military endeavor in Afghanistan should have gone beyond bombing the training camps that Osama bin Laden was using mm -hmm. to train al-Qaeda fighters. And the Taliban could have been punished through other means, such as sanctions, and if direct military force was needed because they were directly involved in the September 11th attacks, that would have been justified as self-defense. But going in and occupying the entire country and putting in its own puppet government, which was the Karzai government, and in fact, under the cover of nation building and development, yeah. well, we saw the product a week ago, the way in which the humiliating withdrawal uh, that just occurred. Right. And similarly with Iraq, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator. There were many Iraqis who, would, who wanted to remove him, but could not have done so peacefully. However, if you went and pulled them after, a year after the U.S. invaded Iraq and forced uh, Saddam out, many of them wanted those days back because at least there was physical safety. So ultimately what the U.S. really wants, as any imperialistic force, is to have a regime that can control its population, usually through dictatorship, and that listens to the U.S. and, and implements U.S. interests in that particular region All of right. the world. It does not support as democracy if the democracy produces a, a lack of obedience to U.S. foreign policy. Mr. Yan, what is your comment? We see already a, a rainbow of uh, opinions. Uh, uh, some suggest that it's the right action to be taken in Afghanistan, and the others also say uh, there might be, uh, you know, the correct side of the decision even to go to other countries like Iraq and, uh, and uh, also Libya and many other things. Uh, only as long as it is staying the course. Uh, we have very different opinions. What is your take, Mr. Yan? Yeah. Uh, right after the 9-11, I think the United States has the incentive to revenge against the terrorist groups because it's a superpower. It's hard to imagine that uh, the United States was hit by extremist uh, terrorist groups. So right after the 9-11 and uh, the world support, supported the, the U.S. But uh, actually later, the uh, U.S. uses the war on terror to achieve other results. And uh, I think the, the U.S. war on terror uh, is a total failure. And 
anyway, it uh, achieved some uh, results for the United States itself because the domestically uh, there are quite a few terror Islamist terrorist attacks in U.S. But uh, the U.S.-led war on terror is a disaster for the international community because it created uh, a lot of uh, st instability, right. created a lot of uh, problems for the other countries, especially in the Middle East, in Africa. So it does not help the world to solve the terrorism problem, but create more problems. But Mr. Yan, some would argue saying that we don't care. Uh, our priority is America first. And therefore, whatever happened to other countries, we don't care, as long as we are safe. That sounds to some years reasonable argument. Yes, because the U.S. government needs to uh, pay attention to the need of the U.S. citizens. Because after 20 years of war on terror, the generally the general public of the United States, the does not want war anymore. So, so, and, uh, so what would you make about those comments, like America first, as long as we are safe, that's okay? No, but that's not okay, uh, especially for uh, is U.S. is the superpower, the number one uh, power in the in the world. It it has the uh, responsibility to, uh, to 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 what the international community to help the uh, terrorism stricken countries. Okay. to uh, improve the uh, security and safety. This is World Insight's special program, 20 years after September 11th. Let me move on to another topic, which is what happened to the U.S. politics since then. Mr. Becker, briefly from you and Ms. Aziz about whether the lesson, uh, as some have already illustrated, at least they see it that way, lessons, uh, have been learned from the U.S. side. Do you think there might be repetition in the near future? Well, unfortunately, having been defeated in Afghanistan to the Taliban and having been unsuccessful in the war in Iraq, uh, and the war in Syria, the U.S. is now pivoting towards a bigger confrontation with the People's Republic of China. I mean, uh, this country seems to be on an endless road towards endless conflict, and the pretext and the target changes. I mean, wouldn't this be an excellent time to rethink whether the United States should spend trillions of dollars trillions of dollars as it did in Afghanistan or Iraq or okay. as it's preparing for confrontation in the South China Sea. So I think American people, many American people, I don't think they're represented in Congress well. I don't think they're represented in the media very well. But a lot of American people are not unhappy with the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, including many Afghan war veterans. I talk to them all the time, including Iraq war veterans. They think it's good that the U.S. left. They think the U.S. should have okay. left a long time ago. And the idea of having another confrontation somewhere else, I mean, no, the U.S., the American people actually don't want Ms. this. Ms. Aziz. American politics has shifted significantly in the last 10 years insofar as the progressive movement, uh, especially among younger generations and within the Democratic Party, has, has become more influential at least in the public discourse and to some extent in Congress with the election of uh, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Ayanna Presley, um, Alexandria uh, Cortez. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing a shift, at least on the left of the of center, that is anti-war, anti-imperialism, anti-occupation, and they will continue to oppose uh, the, the, the new phase of American empire. And I agree with Mr. Becker that there is a shift east because since World War II, at least, okay. uh, the U.S. needed a grand enemy, right? It was the Soviet Union. And then in the 90s, there was this vacuum and suddenly Islam was the green menace and then it turned into the war on terror. And so, yes, there will be people in the government on the Democratic and Republican side looking for a foreign enemy that then galvanizes people to trust the government in foreign policy and not 
uh, challenging. All right. On the other side, we have the far right that has also mobilized and become very uh, strong, as we saw with the election of President Trump. But many of them are isolationist. And so they, are, they also don't want to engage in these foreign interventions. Right. Okay. So, We're running no, out of no, time. No. Uh, let, me, let me also ask you the final question about anti-terrorism, not just in the United States, but worldwide. What is your take about the reality? Everyone has 40 seconds to go. So let me start by you, uh, Ms. Mr. Yan, particularly with what's happening in Afghanistan and beyond. Go ahead. Mm. Uh, the terrorism problem uh, is arising right now, and uh, I think the international community, especially after the uh, U.S. give up the banner of international uh, war on terrorism, the uh, regional powers or the other powers like Russia, China, need to cooperate closely to combat the uh, present terrorism threat. Okay. Professor Gunaratna. Terrorism is a very significant threat 20 years after 9-11. The threat of terrorism has diminished, has not diminished. In fact, it has escalated. Governments should work together to build capabilities to ensure that there is a decline in the threat of terrorism. Very interesting. Well, that's a call rather than um, a solution, I guess. It could be a solution if they really do what you said. Uh, Mr. Becker. Well, I think if the United States continues to arrogate to itself the right to carry out drone missile strikes in many, many countries, the people in those countries will consider that terrorism, and that will provide a recruitment tool for terrorists in those countries. So what we need to find is a way to diminish the cycle of violence okay. and to have a broader understanding of what terrorism looks like. It's not simply... Uh, non-state actors when governments drop bombs on people and kill people at wedding parties. Uh, that feels like terrorism, and in fact it is. So the U.S. has to relook completely at its foreign policy if it really wants to do something to diminish terrorism. Ms. Aziza. Terrorism is a tactic, and it is a product of asymmetrical power, usually uh, arising or are also related to some form of grievance and injustice or um, request or, or, or demand for change by groups who either cannot do it militarily or cannot do it peacefully. What governments should do in their own countries and focusing on their own countries is provide peaceful opportunities for their uh, residents, especially their minorities, to air their grievances without threat of arrest or torture okay. or death and to be able to solve those grievances peacefully. And the international community should help other nations do that rather than resort only to the military to resolve grievances, because that is simply the state version of non-state terrorism. Thank you so much, the four of you, for joining us. 20 years ago, September 11th took place, and the world rallied against terrorism. 20 years later, the world is much more divided in very different directions, and the war against the terror has not been won. Really appreciate it. 20 years after that, we are gathering together to reflect and to think forward. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today. Our special program, 20 years after September 11th. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. You can always look for more when you look at the World Insight and tune in to our YouTube channel as well as looking for us on Facebook and Twitter.